Uh, OK, uh, good evening, everybody. I hope I'm audible uh, and today is session eight out of 12. So we are already we have covered almost 65, 66 percent of the course. And uh, today we'll be discussing about the applications of uh, the genome editing tools that we have learned uh, in diseases, in certain diseases. So there are three diseases we'll be covering. That's thalassemia and uh, SID. Uh, skid, whatever you call it, and then hemophilia. So I'll wait for some time, let's say two, two, three minutes and let everybody join in and then we can start, I guess. So am I audible? If I'm audible and you can see the annotations, please give a thumbs up or something. I think that would be okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, welcome to the eighth session of the weekly live interactive uh, uh, sessions of the course Genome Editing and Engineering, which is taken by Professor Utpal Bora from IIT Guwahati. I'm Sanket, uh, a Prime Minister's Research Fellow from the School of Biological Sciences, IIT Delhi. So today we will be discussing about three diseases as we have all, as I already told you. The first of it, uh, first of which is thalassemia. So we know that thalassemia is a blood disorder. You must be knowing about it. It's a blood disorder, and when uh, it happens when there is not enough production of hemoglobin in the blood, uh, in in the body, right? That is uh, uh, how it is. So the shortage of hemoglobin it causes. Uh, you know, reduction in the number of RBCs. RBCs are reduced in number because of the absence of hemoglobin or shortage of hemoglobin, right? Now, we already know that hemoglobin molecule, the adult one, they are, they, it is formed of two, it's a heterotetrameric uh, protein. So it's made up of two, uh, I mean, uh, monomers, I would say. So two essentially it's alpha and beta, right? Alpha and beta. And based on the reduction of either of these two, uh, it's either alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia, right? That is how it is. It's a hereditary disorder. So that's one thing. It's hereditary. It is autosomal recessive. Right. And uh, there are defects in hemoglobin production. That is, I think, very clear to everybody uh, by this point. So uh, it is different from other hemoglobo uh, hemoglobinopathies. So if we talk about some other hemoglobinopathies, uh, so for example, if we talk about sickle cell anemia, uh, there we have 
there are structural defects in hemoglobin, right? But in this case, it's different. In thalassemia, there is a decreased synthesis of either alpha or beta chain of hemoglobin, right? That is how it is. Now, if we talk about uh, the signs and symptoms of this disease, the first symptom is anemia. Anemia, so anemia is definitely the first symptom which comes up due to absence of uh, hemoglobin. So there is, because hemoglobin is the molecule that carries oxygen in the blood. So it is the hemoglobin has iron in it. It's a ferrous molecule. This iron is important to bind to you know, oxygen, carbon monoxide and nitric oxide. All this is already discussed, but because of this reduction in hemoglobin, there is anemic uh, symptoms. So like there is shortness of breath, cold hands and feet, pale skin, irritability, dark urine, heart palpitations and fatigue. Another thing that happens is uh, again, iron overload. Uh, that is, uh, this is not a um, direct, you know, uh, symptom of the disease, but uh, thalassemia patients, the conventional therapy approach is uh, giving is blood transfusion. So whenever uh, blood transfusions happen, uh, there is this problem of iron overload where, you know, excessive iron is um, is administered into the body that has some damage or deleterious effects. So it happens in the heart, liver and endocrine system, right? Another thing is there could be uh, infections that could happen because of this blood transfusion again. Uh, and um, patients are more vulnerable to uh, infection, right? And then there are bone deformities, uh, again, due to uh, the problem of uh, lack of hemoglobin. Uh, there are some skeletal malformation uh, and all this. And then there is another thing that happens is enlarged spleen, spleen which is uh, which is an organ you must be knowing. So this is called splenomegaly. These are the symptoms or signs of the disease. So if we talk about the history of it, how uh, how was this discovered uh, initially or how it was uh, found out. So it was first reported by an American pediatrician. And uh, hematologist. He was Thomas Benton Cooley. And this happened in 1925, right? In 1925, uh, this happened. And uh, he observed that the infant mortality rate in Italian and Greek immigrants were high. And the symptoms like splenomegaly and bone deformation, these were observed, right? And uh, he coined this term as erythroblastic anemia. But later it was popularly known as Cooley's anemia because uh, he, wa he was the one who discovered this, who reported this. In 1932, uh, George Hoyt Whipple he, uh, and W. L. Bradford, these two people, they worked on the pathology and they established its association with the people who originated from the Mediterranean uh, a region, right? And the Black Sea. And that's how the name thalassemia came in. So it, it, it means uh, thalassa means sea uh, and uh, amia is blood. So it's a blood disease uh, which comes from the uh, Black Sea. That is how it was named. If we talk about the epidemiology, it is uh, it is uh, very much prevalent in Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, India, and Africa, and it shares its endemicity with malaria. Very unique. We'll um, uh, this is an observation. So it shares its. Uh, uh, endemicity with malaria and the, due to population uh, like population migration from uh, different continents this has spread to other parts of the world as well so approximately 
seven percent of the world population are thalassemia carriers. Right, and it is uh, it is uh, actually uh, concentrated at. Okay, I'm, yeah, I think the slides are not moving. Just give me a second. To adjust this. There's some lag. I think it's because of the internet issue. I'll just rejoining very soon. Uh, just let me rejoin. Oh, uh, it's not yet not showing this. This being visible, I don't think it is. How to look more and to Yeah, I think this time it will work. Yeah, so as I was saying, 7% of the world population, they have, they are carriers of this disease and it's concentrated in the tropical and subtropical uh, regions, right? Um, alpha thalassemia, uh, they, if they provide natural protection to carriers against uh, malaria, so there's a very weak evidence to this. Uh, there's a very weak link uh, that is there uh, between alpha thalassemia patient and their um, their uh, you know protection from um, this uh, malaria. So probably that is the reason why their endemicity are shared. So probably where malaria is more common, there we have uh, uh, this alpha thalassemia uh, patients as well. If we talk about the human globin gene clusters, we are talking about the alpha globin and beta globin. So uh, hemoglobin is formed of two, out of like two alpha and two beta chains, as you already know. Alpha chains are 141 amino acid, beta ones are 146 amino acid. Um, they together form hemoglobin, right? And uh, uh, these uh, globin it uh, folds. These globin folds. They hold a ferrin uh, molecule. So it holds uh, Fe2 plus 
uh, in the center, and this is exactly what is required for oxygen binding, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, uh, oxide binding. Now, if we talk about the human globin gene cluster, uh, if we talk about the alpha globin, right? Uh, if we talk about alpha globin, it's in the chromosome 16. Uh, so if you look at it, if this is the telomere, uh, then we have something like this. So HS40. And then we have um, the zeta gene. This is the zeta gene. And then we have uh, two adult um, alpha genes, or it could be fetal also. I mean, alpha 2 and alpha 1. So this is how the gene cluster is arranged in chromosome 16. So there are three functional genes. The zeta gene, which is the embryonic uh, hemoglobin gene. Then there are two uh, fetal, to, uh, fetal or adult alpha, HbA1, HbA2 genes, which are present. If we talk about the beta globin cluster, if we talk about the beta globin cluster, there we have uh, this, we have this on chromosome 11 right chromosome 11 and there we have um the five upstream uh, five four three two one these are upstream to this gene these are promoter regions and then we have uh, the epsilon g delta Sorry, G gamma, uh, A gamma, and then delta and uh, beta. This is how the gene cluster looks like. And uh, so the epsilon one, this is the embryonic. This is the, this is important for hemoglobin in the embryonic stage. G delta, A, uh, sorry. G gamma, A gamma, these two are for uh, fetal stage, fetal hemoglobin, and adult hemoglobin are formed by these two, the delta and beta uh, genes, right? So clearly we can say uh, from this that uh, the expression of this gene, of these genes are regulated uh, based on the age, right, of of the organism, in this case, the human. So uh, it is differently expressed at different stage of development. That is what I'm trying to say. And um, hence, uh, these are regulated through epigenetic mechanisms. That's how it's done. So based on, uh, you know, which chain of the, uh, you know, hemoglobin is, or the human, the globin uh, gene cluster is absent, Based on that, there are three types of thalassemia. That is alpha, beta, which we already discussed. These two thalassemia. Then there is delta, beta, where both of these are absent. And there are some rare ones also, uh, which are not that much clinically uh, present. That is the delta and the gamma thalassemia. So which of, whichever chain is uh, absent in... Um, in uh, I would say, or it is not pre uh, expressed properly. Th that is how uh, that that is the different type of thalassemia which we uh, encounter. So if we talk about alpha thalassemia, so if we if you remember about the uh, alpha globin gene cluster, it was in um, chromosome. It was in chromosome sixteen. So there are two copies of alpha in one particular uh, chromosome and then we are deployed. So there are like four copies essentially. So there is four copies of uh, alpha gene in a normal deployed cell, right? Uh, so 95% of alpha thalassemia that, hap that happens due to the deletion of one or more alpha globin gene with variable length of alpha globin locus. Now this deletion, how does it, does it happen? Deletion happens due to incomplete crossing over during meiosis. Uh, 
so this is how it happens. There are more than 120 mutations that are reported for uh, alpha thalassemia, right? And there are four major gene defects. Uh, so they are like alpha plus, alpha zero, alpha, alpha E and non-deletion mutants. So you can read about these in the slides, but uh, these are the four major gene defects for alpha thalassemia. Now talking about beta thalassemia, again, uh, if you remember the beta globin gene cluster, there is one gene in, e, in one of the chromosomes, chromosome uh, 11 in this case. So one copy in chromosome 11, there would be two chromosome uh, 11s uh, because of the diploid nature. So normal diploid cells, will have two copies of this gene. Right? And if there one of the copies is impaired, then there is mild anemia. If there is uh, both the copies of these genes are impaired, then uh, it causes severe anemia and it, it is life threatening. So for beta thalassemia, there is uh, non deletion type mutations. Uh, so then like there is single nucleotide substitution, right? Then there is short insertions or deletions. So all this leads to a uh, change in the reading frame of the protein. Frame shift happens and that's why uh, the protein becomes non-functional. So also deletion of beta globin uh, gene upstream locus. If there are deletions here, then also it could lead to uh, beta thalassemia, although it's rare. So uh, based on the quantitative reduction in the production of beta globin, uh, beta globin genes, we could classify beta thalassemia as uh, B, beta naught, that is absence of beta globin gene. It could be uh, beta plus, which is basically uh, reduced production and it could be beta plus plus that is uh, minimal reduction very slight reduction of beta globin gene production so if we talk about therapies so as i all as we as i already i think mentioned once one of the most conventional way of therapy is uh, blood transfusion, one of the most uh, preferred ways. I mean, it's easy, but then again, uh, there are certain complications. So transfusion dependent patients, uh, uh, they get RBCs, they get the red blood cells from the trans from the donor so that they have adequate number of hemoglobins. Hemoglobin levels are adequate. Now thalassemia major and intermediate. So again, uh, thalassemia major, minor, and intermediate is basically based on the severity of the disease. So thalassemia major and intermediate, these two group of patients, they require regular blood transfusion. Uh, okay. Uh, so what happens due to this blood transfusion, this suppressed hemoglobin production is basically masked or through the new blood, which will have enough hemoglobin. Uh, some risks associated with this is uh, alloimmunization. And blood-borne infection. And also the iron overload. This is something we will discuss. But uh, blood-borne infections, like you know, certain viruses which can spread through 
uh, infected needles, sutures, stuff like that, like HIV, for example, can spread through blood transfusions. We already know aluminization is basically when you are getting some other blood. Uh, so it's the best if you get it from an HLA match donor. So anyway, blood matching is one of the problems. Another problem could be that since you are getting blood from a foreign, uh, I mean, some other person, that blood might have immune cells which would target your organs and stuff like that. That is aluminization that would have certain effects. Uh, iron overload is also called hemosiderosis. That is a very common problem uh, and uh, you know it causes liver fibrosis and other complications. Uh, so if the serum ferritin levels are more than 1000 nanogram per ml, in that case we go for uh, iron chelation therapy. So these are some iron, uh, there are some iron uh, chelators which are very readily available. So, for example, uh, there is uh, subcutaneous or intravenous administration of certain iron chelators. It could be deferoxamine or uh, deferiprone. These are some examples of iron chelators which are administered. They are routinely administered to patients. Uh, then there is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, which is where, uh, you know, uh, from the stem cell, from the bone marrow, they are uh, taken and they are then, um, you know, transplanted from the donor to the patient, right? So that is how it is done. Uh, so it substitutes for ineffective erythropoietic stem cell with effective cells. Now, patients which are less than 14 years of age, they have higher success rate of, with this um, kind of, uh, you know, treatment method. However, there could again be complications. There could be complications like uh, in uh, GVHD, that is graft versus host disease. There could be graft failure and, you know, all those kind of things uh, which can happen. These are some limitations of the therapy. Um, also, another uh, complication with this is that you would require immunosuppressants. So essentially, whenever you take some foreign cell into your body, it will always be attacked. So your immune system will be overwhelmed by it and it will start attacking those cells. That's why HLA matching is very important. But however, to get HLA match donor is very, very difficult. And that's why immunosuppressants are given to people who receive this kind of therapy. Uh, another way of, uh, you know, going about this problem, as we are already said that, uh, you know, in hemoglobin clusters, there is fetal hemoglobin, embryonic hemoglobin. These genes are present and they are expressed in in the initial phase of development. However, later they are inactivated through epigenetic mechanisms. Hence, uh, reactivation of these fetal hemoglobin could be one of the approach to solve the problem. Now, for this, there are demethylating agents like 5-azacitidine. Uh, it's a demethylating agent which uh, reactivates gamma globin genes, if you remember G gamma and A gamma. So they reactivate these genes and uh, that causes, uh, you know, um, proper production of fetal hemoglobin. It compensates for the lack of adult hemoglobin. So uh, erythropoietin is also given. It's, it's it's a proliferative and anti uh, apoptotic uh, protein, so it is also given. And hydroxyurea is another uh, which is given. It's a cost-effective drug, so like that it can be given. Another approach would be gene therapy. Gene therapy in gene therapy we can use iPSCs, which are induced pluripotent stem cells. So basically, you get 
uh, the cells from um, the do from the patient itself and you induce stem cellness stemness in them you uh, so that can be done uh, there could be uh, lentiviral vectors which could be used so lentiviral vectors will carry the proper beta globin genes and these will be produced they will express these beta globin gene in the patient that is how it is done uh, lentiviral vectors are used because they have non integrating function so they do not integrate if we use retroviral vectors in that case they will integrate and they will have other problems okay there would be ab uh, aberrant proliferation genotoxicity which could happen so uh, however uh, there are disadvantages also like uh, febrile uh, neutropenia epistasis stomatitis pyrexia all these things are some uh, disadvantages if we talk about gene editing so for gene editing we can use programmable nucleases which we have already studied by now so they are like zinc finger nuclease talens or the crispr cas9 system whatever we have studies so we can induce a uh, uh, damage and then we can uh, go for repair through either homology directed repair or non homologous end joining to correct the gene right uh, so these are some of the ways about um, hemoglobin uh, basically uh, your uh, sorry thalassemia now we'll talk a little bit about skid so it's skid stands for severe combined immunodeficiency so there are mutations uh, which are involved in development and function of immune cells uh, which cause this this disease there are around 18 genes that are implicated with uh, skid uh, linked to skid it is uh, an usually an autosomal recessive disorder and the most common one of uh, of the skid is the ada skid which is adenosine deaminase deficiency So, skid is a group of uh, rare and life threatening disease that are caused by monogenic def uh, defects. Its severe forms of uh, primary immunodeficiency are formed. Autosomal recessive skid could be there, or there could be, uh, it's usually autosomal recessive, but it could also be X linked. So, that is also, that is if the skid is due to a gene which is present in the X chromosome. So, uh, skid could be of two types. It could be P minus B minus skid. In this case, there is defect in both the T cells and B cells of the immune cell uh, immune system. So if there are defect in both, it is the T minus B minus skid. And here the NK cells, natural killer cells, they are normal. They do not have any effect. If we talk about T minus B plus skid, there, uh, there is absence of, uh, so defect or absence of T cells uh, and the natural killer cells where B cells are fine. They are, they have no uh, problem. They are actually upregulated. So uh, for example, if we take for these kind of skids, it would be RAC deficiency or it could be Artemis deficiency, all these kind of thing, all these uh, are under T minus B minus kit for T minus B plus kit. Uh, there are like IL two RG uh, skid which happens. IL two RG gene mutation that comes under this. So uh, if we look at uh, uh, yeah the pathogenetic mechanisms of skid, there it could be due to several reasons first uh, is the defective survival of uh, hematopoietic 
lineage precursor. There could be a problem in VDJ recombination. And the T cell receptors. OK, there could be a problem there. There could be a problem in cytokine. Signaling. There could be a problem uh, due to toxic uh, metabolite accumulation. Then again, uh, T cell receptor abnormalities could be there and then thymic uh, abnormalities or in the thymus basically. So if we talk, you can read about it in the lectures. If we talk about the diagnosis part, uh, skid is usually diagnosed through flow cytometry where the immune cells are basically uh, lymphocytes usually be uh, figure out what is their status, what are their numbers through flow cytometry. Another way of doing it, uh, we could also find the T cell function uh, in vitro measurement of how T cell functions. That could be one of the diagnostic method for like ADA skid and PNP skid. These for these kind of deficiencies, we can directly for uh, perform ADA and PNP assays to diagnose. Uh, skin. So since these are enzymes, right? If we talk about the conventional therapy, uh, usually immunoglobin replacement therapy is the one of the conventional therapies. Uh, the other therapy uh, would be antimicrobial prophylaxis. So these are conventional therapy. Uh, a little bit advanced if we look at a therapy method that would be hematopoietic stem cell transplantation as we have already discussed in thalassemia also this is similar in this case the survival rate is above 70 percent overall however if uh, you have a genetically uh, identical sibling uh, so in that case the survival becomes more than 90 percent however uh, the there are several factors which influence this survival rate. That is the donor matching, the patient age, and um, uh, infection if there it is already present or not. So if infection if infection is already present, and since these patients are immunocompromised, it will lead to uh, complications. So if we talk about um, some other things like gene therapy. Uh, so in case of gene therapy for skid, it was uh, one of the first uh, gene therapy approaches, which was uh, discovered in 14, uh, 14 September. I would not say discovered. It was formulated in 14 September 1990. And it was by Ashanti D. Silva. For ADA skid. Um, so there are limitations with gene therapy, which is very common to what we have uh, seen earlier also, that there could be integration of viral vectors. Yeah, that could be one of the limitations. Integration. So random integration into any of the, you know, uh, any of the part of the chromosome could lead to several complications. Another thing could be there could be upregulated transgene expression. So suppose you're targeting a gene for skid, but some other gene is upregulated or downregulated. So upregulated transgene expression is another limitation. For genome editing approaches, as I already said before, we can use it fingers, we can use uh, talons and then CRISPR for it, and you can read about it uh, in those lecture slides. Now, if we talk about hemophilia, uh, this is the third uh, disease which we'll talk about, and we'll I'll try to finish it soon. So hemophilia is a hereditary blood disorder, HBD, hereditary blood disorder. And uh, these are group of diseases which are inherited um, where hemostasis is affected. So the process of blood making that is affected. 
So there could be deficiency or functional abnormality of, of one of the plasma proteins which are involved in coagulation of blood. Uh, so that is how uh, what what happens in hemophilia. So in hemophilia, the blood cannot clot. Okay, so uh, among the hereditary blood disease is there are two diseases. One is the hemophilia, and uh, another one is uh, Wilbrand disease. Okay, uh, so around four lakh. Uh, people in India, they suffer from hemophilia. Out of which only 25%, like 1 lakh of these people, they only receive treatment for it. So what happens, there is painful and spontaneous hemorrhages. Hemorrhages is like blood oozing out of the vessels. That's what happens uh, from into joints and soft tissues. It's life threatening. It can happen in intracranially, you know, inside your skull gastrointestinal from neck, neck or throat. So hemoarthrosis, it happens in 70 to 80% of all bleeding episodes. If we talk a little bit about uh, history in 1803, John Conrad Otto, he was the first one to uh, report this disease. He was the first one to report this disease. Um, and in 1813, uh, John Hay, he reported in New England Journal of Medicine that affected uh, men could uh, affected men could pass this trait to unaffected daughter. So that is how uh, it was. Uh, that is what he uh, reported. Uh, and Frederick Hopp in 1828. He was the person who coined the term hemophilia. Okay, uh, in 1947, in 1947, Dr. Alfredo Pelvosky he distinguished two types of hemophilia, which is hemophilia A and hemophilia B. So he distinguished that in his lab, and it was called as the uh, as a royal disease. Why? Because first, uh, it, it is hereditary and due to uh, in royal families uh, in the 19th and 20th century, in the royal family, this, this kind of diseases were very common. Like, um, I mean, hemophilia was very common in royal families there. So uh, from England, Germany, Russia and Spain or everywhere. Uh, even Queen Victoria, who ruled from 1837 to 1901, she was also uh, a carrier of this disease and she uh, had factor 9 deficiency. Um, we'll, we'll see what that is, factor 8, factor 9 deficiency. That is basically hemophilia B. She had this disease and she, uh, she basically um, passed this defect to three of her nine children. Uh, so uh, this disease, uh, since it is uh, heavily sex linked, um, so uh, it it and it's autosomal recessive. Uh, so what happens is, uh, since royal families to maintain their pure blood, they have consanguineous, uh, you know, consanguineous uh, relationships. That means they usually marry uh, their cousins or you know very close uh, relatives. That is why these these kind of complications they come up more in royal families. And similar things happen in I think. Uh, Egypt also it used to happen. That's why uh, there is a higher incidence of this disease there as well. So if we talk about uh, the epidemiology, it's it's distributed worldwide equally. So that is there. And uh, the frequency of this is one in 10,000. OK, if we talk about hemophilia A, it is one in 5,000. So that is there. For hemophilia B, it is 1 in 30,000. And for hemophilia C, um, it happens in 1 in 1 lakh live births, right? So if we talk about uh, the types of hemophilia, uh, if we talk about that, it can be classified into the deficiency of the blood clotting factor. 
So if we talk about the blood clotting factor here, so if there is a deficiency in let's say factor eight or factor nine or factor 11, based on this, it is called hemophilia A, hemophilia B or hemophilia C. Right? Hemophilia A is a classic uh, hemophilia uh, and is a second most common type of you know, hereditary blood disease. And um, yeah, so again, based on severity, if we talk about, then hemophilia can be classified as either mild or moderate or severe. So that is based on what are the levels of factor eight or nine. In case of mild hemophilia, it would be five to 50 units per uh, deciliter. For moderate, it would be one to five units. And for severe, it would be less than one unit per uh, this. So you can uh, study about the structure of each of these factors. Uh, now coming to the treatment. So the conventional uh, treatment is desmopressin therapy. Uh, so, or we can also administer clotting factors. Right, these two things can be done. Uh, clotting factors, if they are administered with polyethylene glycol or something like that, it will basically enhance its half-life. That also could be done. Then there is gene therapy approaches, obviously, uh, which could be there to um, you know, cure this disease. You can read about it. So let's come to the interactive part of the session. Uh, so question number one, thalassemia is a hereditary disorder and it is inherited in an autosomal do dominant manner, autosomal recessive. Decrease synthesis of alpha chains or decrease synthesis of beta chains? What would be the answer to this? Anyone would like to option say? Option B, sir. You are right. Or option B. So you can read about um, this. Uh, it's, it's given in the slide. I'm not covering it up again. And it's a hereditary uh, disease and it's also autosomal recessive. So we have talked about all these things. Uh, if we talk about, uh, come to question two, how many functional genes are there in beta globin gene clusters? Option A, sir. Five. Okay. We have. So it has actually three functional genes. Okay, it's beta globin. Five functional genes, you're right. According to the degree of uh, quantitative reduction in the production of beta globin, beta thalassemia alleles are classified into three categories. Which of the following option is not in the category? Absence of beta globin or B naught. Beta globin is produced but reduced, beta plus. Beta globin production is minimally reduced or uh, delta globin is produced and increased. Option D, sir. You're right. Okay. You can read about these slides. I have included all the information. It's also present in your lecture slides. But anyway, I'm not covering up uh, that up again because it will take some time. Dash is the major factor in switching of uh, uh, gamma to beta globin production in adulthood, which activates expression of BCL11A, SOX6, and ZBTB7A to inhibit the expression of gamma globin gene. Is it KLF1, BCL1, GATA1, or HPFH1? So, Globin repressors are basically BAF chromatin remodeling complex subunit BCL 11A, SRY box, SOX6, HBS1L, KLF1, and uh, ZBTB7A. So these are the repressors. Uh, but 
but klf1 that is the major uh, factor which is used for switching of uh, from you know delta uh, from gamma globin to beta globin so klf1 is a major factor so basically from fetal hemoglobin to adult hemoglobin klf1 is a major factor which is involved for uh, this okay question 5 hpfh mutation called british hpfh is caused by point mutation of the dash in promoter of the fetal globin gene option b sir you are right option b is the answer you can read about it so uh, british hpfh is caused by point mutation in the 198 t2c in the promoter of the fetal uh, hemoglobin gene natural killer cells are predominant innate lymphocyte subsets that mediate anti immune and antibacterial responses anti tumor and anti fungal responses anti histamine and anti viral responses or anti tumor and anti viral responses option d so they mediate anti tumor and anti viral responses you can read about it in the first trials of gene therapy for skate retroviral vectors were used in which of the in which expression of the normal transgene sorry retroviral vectors were used in which expression of the normal transgene was driven by retrovirus long terminal repeat self inactivating retrovirus graft versus host disease or immunoglobulin uh, replacement therapy option a yes so in the first tri trials of gene therapy for skid retroviral uh, vectors were used in which the expression of normal transgene was Uh, driven by the retrovirus long terminal repeats but if you remember um, the problem with retrovirus is it can integrate into the chromosome and it can cause certain complications hemophilia is used usually an inherited bleeding disorder in which the blood does not clot bleed generate or repair option a yeah that's pretty clear we have already discussed it okay uh question 9 the f8 gene is a large gene comprising of 10 exons 25 exons 30 exons or 26 exons this is structure of the factor 8 when you of you remember it has uh, 26 exons and in, introns this is how it looks like you can read about it the asc 618 construct consists of an adeno associated viral vector which encodes a codon optimized a uh, human uh, f8 gene that has been minimized by deleting the h domain b domain a domain or c domain any answers so b domain has been the one which has been deleted in this you can read about the strategies now question 11 a patient is diagnosed with absence or absent or reduced production of both uh, delta and beta globin chain which type of thalassemia does he has uh, delta beta delta beta thalassemia or uh, gamma thalassemia it's pretty easy actually 
Option C. Yeah, you're right. Option C is the right answer. How many mutations have been identified so far worldwide to cause beta thalassemia? Is it 1050, 105, 350 or 3050? Option C. Again, you're right. Um, which type of alpha thalassemia is characterized by mild to moderate mental retardation? Is it ATR6 syndrome, ATR26 syndrome? Hemoglobin Bart syndrome or ATR116 syndrome? I don't know if you can see the question. Yeah. Which type of alpha thalassemia is characterized by mild to moderate mental retardation? Yes. You're right. Which of the following risk is not associated with blood transfusion therapy? Is it alloimmunization, blood bond infection, severe allergic reaction, or compromised immunity? Option D. You're right. Uh, all the rest three, they do happen by blood transfusion. Which of the following is not true about severe combined immunodeficiency disease? It's a group of rare disorders caused by mutations in different genes. Mutated genes involve development and function of immune cells. X-linked skid primarily, primarily affect female infants. And skid is inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern. Which of the following is not true? Option C. Yes, you are right. Option C is the right answer. What percentage of skid is re, re, uh, in children are caused by reticular dysgenesis? Is it 5%, 50%, 4%, or 2%? 2%. Percent. Two percent. You are right. Lower levels of which of the following clotting factors cause hemophilia? hemophilia? Is it either factor 8 or factor 9, factor 12, and factor 11? Only factor 10 or none of the above? Option A. You are right. Which of the following pair is uh, correct? Hemophilia A is and factor 9 deficiency, hemophilia B and factor 9 deficiency, hemophilia C and factor 9 deficiency, or hemophilia B and factor 11 deficiency? Option B. You are right. Which of the following can be caused by an intrachromosomal inversion involving intron 22 of the coagulation factor 8 gene? Is it mild hemophilia B, mild hemophilia A, severe hemophilia B, or severe hemophilia A? Would be severe hemophilia A. Which of the following characterize the T minus B plus skid defects in both T and B cells? The absence of mature T and natural killer lymphocytes while B cells are present in increased number. The absence of B cell while mature T and NK lymphocytes are present in increased number. Absence or decreased production of B cells. Option B. Option B. You are right. Option B, actually. B. Absence of mature T and NK uh, lymphocytes. That's why it's T minus. And B plus because B is upregulated. Fine. So that's all uh, for today's session. Uh, I'll just stop the recording. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask.